Martin, let's see. Okay, recording in progress, got it. <laughs> uh, uh, thank you so much for this introduction, really beautiful introduction, thank you. Uh, uh, I wish you had recorded this introduction too. Uh, but, and uh, so welcome everyone also, thank you for, uh, for coming and attending this lecture. Um, I start immediately uh, without further hesitation because um, I will try to stay, so within the 40 minutes that there is enough time for, uh, for some discussion after that. So I will share the screen now uh, and... like this okay so yeah i took the occasion today to uh, present a bit to the uh, general results uh, that we have achieved in the last um, let's say two years uh, uh, in the project the project started already much earlier and the project is uh, the title of the project is the sphere knowledge system evolution in the shared scientific identity of europe um, uh, the general uh, general questions uh, we deal with in, in the projects are related to uh, processes of transformations of knowledge, um, more in particular uh, processes of homogenization of knowledge and mathematization of scientific knowledge, as we are going to speak about the early modern period, uh, then as we immediately realized the process of mathematization is a very important subject, homogenization, uh, identity shaping processes are as well, uh, very, very important too for this period. As uh, Martin already anticipated, uh, a, this uh, project uh, works around basically uh, one uh, specific text. It's uh, uh, the Tractatus de Sfera of uh, Johannes de Sacrobosco, which is a qualitative introduction to uh, geocentric cosmology compiled that we were in the 13th century, so in late, uh, late medieval period, in the frame of uh, teaching at the University of Paris. So we are going to speak today only about textbooks, books used at the universities. And uh, uh, concerning uh, the, uh, the part of the, of the project that relates to the late medieval period, because we obviously start from the moment where the, the text was compiled for the first time, uh, there we don't apply any, you know, digital humanities technique or any other kind of things for the reason, uh, and the reason is that it is very, very difficult to get to, uh, to achieve a systematic data set. So today, therefore, I will speak only about the early modern period, which is the second phase of the life of the edition history of, uh, of this treatise. Uh, maybe I should have uh, mentioned that what we do here, as this text is very representative because then it became a uh, um, a text used all over Europe and for a class, the Introduction in Astronomy and Cosmology, that was mandatory for all the students. So that's why we consider then the corpus that we collected as a representative corpus and uh, also to make inferences in, or historical conclusions concerning identity shaping uh, processes. We obviously don't look at this text only and its uh, uh, hundreds of real occurrences, because may, most of them are actually always the same text, but we look mostly uh, at the uh, connections between these texts and other texts, and this will become clear, more clear in, uh, in a second. So as I said, we move to the early modern period, and here we have the chance to get a systematic data set, and this is concerned with the printed editions. And uh, we uh, collected all of them, uh, starting from the first printed edition in 1472, and we collected 359 different printed editions, which means uh, that if you take an average print run, realistic one for the time uh, of about 1,000 copies, uh, so basically our studies then refer to a potential of 350,000 books uh, that were circulating in Europe, whether they were all used is so of course uh, uh, a question that cannot be answered, um, in, but in the term of 178 years. Uh, after 1650, uh, books uh, containing the uh, Tractatus de Sfera of Sacrobosco were still produced, but in 1650, the relevance for the teaching at the university of this text uh, declined uh, pretty quickly. So that's why we stopped there. So these are uh, historical cuts, so to speak, and artificial cuts. So we collected all our data uh, by uh, means of a repository that we built and we call it Corpus Tracer. 
uh, is based on a knowledge graph, an RDF knowledge graph, and the data are model is model uh, are model according to the ontology CI CRM and an extension for bibliographic reports. So here you see uh, the uh, ontology graph that we have for all our data. And uh, we uh, extract our data starting from the uh, uh, confirmation that there is a material uh, exemplar uh, of uh, a specific edition for which we found the metadata. And uh, then we collect the electronic copy of uh, this edition. And then we extract data on one side that are representative for the contents of the books, uh, what we call uh, knowledge atoms. Uh, so semantic, uh, meaningful uh, data, and other data, of course, then all the, the possible metadata, and, but also other data that are related to uh, the social and institutional or economic context of production of those books. Obviously, we don't have information about the usage of the books, if not only exemplarily, but not systematically, because then we would move from 359 edition to 350,000 editions, most of them are no more existing. Uh, so that's why there is the, the project can only be silent in the sense that we can only make case studies when we find uh, books, for instance, with annotations or this kind of things. Um, <clears throat> here are some further uh, uh, introductory slides. Uh, here is the, the geotemporal distribution of the production of the books. You see that the peak, more or less, uh, at the bottom of uh, production is about the at about the half of the 16th century, which is you know 300 years after the original compilation of the treaty. So you know this was uh, this is uh, not uh, it's not by chance that it's considered the first big great book, uh, bestseller in science uh, in Western culture. Um, the distribution of production covers not really completely Europe, but it's uh, great parts of it. The biggest centers of production are Paris and Venice. Uh, this is not a surprise because they were the biggest center of productions of printed books in general. Um, then we have a very important uh, uh, taxonomy, uh, important uh, for the talk, uh, especially uh, in our corpus of 359 books. Uh, so we have those books that contain the original text only. Uh, we have those books that are uh, beside the original text uh, that is contained in a segmented way. Um, uh, paragraphs of the original, the reference text are commented and usually printed in a way that you see the paragraph of the original text and the commentary around. Then we have compilations of text. So this is when uh, uh, the Tractatus is there. And then there are other texts in the books that um, uh, deepen, for instance, the specific subjects of the original treatise. And so in a sense, they are also co uh, commentaries, but they are, not, uh, they are not layouted or prepared in form of commentaries, but they are sort of independent texts. They can be read also alone, in principle, or isolated. Then we have the biggest group of the corpus, which is uh, a composition of the last two groups, so commentaries and compilation. And then we have the last group, which is very important today. It's a group of books that we call adaptions. And these books actually do not contain the Tractatus of Sacerdoste, but they contain uh, at least one text part that is also a qualitative introduction to uh, uh, geocentric cosmology. And it's uh, very much related to Sacerdoste for three reasons. One is that because it, it maintains the same structure of the original treatise. Um, it uh, uh, also discussed the same subjects in the same order. And uh, it makes at least partial use of the same visual apparatus. These are where the three criteria to enlarge our, uh, our corpus in order to take into the corpus books that are already quite already, they are still quite close to the tradition of Sacrobosco, but may maybe find a way also to diverge a bit to insert eventual innovations. So we can, in these cases, sometimes we have just a normal paraphrases of Sacrobosco could belong to this group. But sometimes we have books that depart a little bit more from them, where the subjects are discussed in the same order, but not exactly in the same way from a point of view, point of view of a scientific point of view. Um, so now let's go to the knowledge atoms. So the, those uh, data representative for the content of the treaties. Considering our research questions, because the data you extract always depends on the research questions you have, we extracted three sorts of data, text parts, uh, images, scientific illustrations, and tables, which in astronomy are computational numerical tables. 
Today, I will speak only about results that we achieved by analyzing the data concerning the text files. Uh, I have some material concerning our work with scientific illustrations and tables. Uh, that is where we apply all our machine learning technologies, uh, but uh, I won't discuss this in my, in my talk. If you're interested, you, could, you can ask in, uh, in the QA time later on. So when we collected the text files, we just went uh, through the books and we dissected the books into text files. So for us, the treatises are compositions or constellations of text files. And, but these text parts um, are of different sorts and uh, they can be, for instance, original text, which means new text, texts that are printed for the first time, written by, uh, by uh, contemporary authors, or they can be commentaries on original text. It can be translations of a commentary or an original text. So all the possibilities among these three categories uh, adding the possibility to have fragments uh, are all embedded in our knowledge graph. So you could have a fragment of a commentary on a translation of an original text, for instance. So you can make it very complex and indeed the sources obliged that to make it very complex. And so basically then we have a first approach to network here uh, in the knowledge graph that we created, which basically uh, uh, mirrors all the, all the possible uh, relations between these text parts that we have identified as the constituents of the treatises. And these are semantic relations, you know, uh, sort of uh, when we speak a commentary of something else is, a, is because there is a semantic relation. Here, a little, a little, a little example. This is, for instance, a text part uh, or, uh, of one book uh, that starts at page 23, and it is a, uh, a commentary on uh, Johannes de Sacrobosco's Tractatus, written by Prostocevo de Beldomandi. Uh, and um, so this is the way we, we do it. Then we have, um, we have another approach to network, and this is the temporal approach. The reason for this is that um, we have in total 444 text parts, uh, original text parts, sorry, and then uh, um, uh, between commentaries and translation, 119. But some of these text parts also reoccur in time. So we have the semantic uh, relations among them, but then we have also the temporal relations among them because of the fact that they reoccur maybe in another book printed in another place by other people in a completely different institutional context. And the number of occurrences, uh, uh, so there are 239 parts that reoccur, all of the commentaries and translation reoccur, and then a portion of the original text parts also reoccur. The total number, the absolute, absolute number of reoccurrences is 1,653, uh, and the reoccurrences range from one till 89 times. So we have parts that reoccur only once and up to 89 times and many other numbers uh, in between. So as you have seen, when uh, I'm not speaking really about uh, astronomy and cosmology and uh, uh, so let's say the, con the scientific content. This is something that we do once we have identified specific books and specific uh, 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 aspects of the processes of transformation. And then we go back to the close reading and we will do it once uh, today. But basically we are focusing on the way on the mechanisms of knowledge production. We are focusing on questions such as uh, what is more relevant to gain attention in the early modern period, writing a new text or write, translating into local tongues or um, uh, commenting on uh, an authoritative text. And uh, so we made several studies. I will show the first one, only the results. I don't enter into the, into the way that uh, we, uh, you know, the, the, the formal aspects that we use to make this study. This study was published in 2019, uh, and it was published in the Journal of Historical Network Research. Um, uh, by the way, I forgot to say, you should have received yesterday an email where uh, um, uh, that shared a handout. Uh, in this handout, you will find always this information that I have in certain slides where uh, the network, the structure of the network is explained or described. So, and uh, all the edges and links, because this will happen a few times during the talk. And if I go into this description, then we only make the description of the network in 40 minutes and we are not able to, to do anything else. So if, if this, is, this handout is for you to follow better the, the, the talk, but, and if you have questions on some of the graphs uh, of the layers, of course, we can discuss them uh, at, uh, after the talk. So here are the results that we achieved in this first study, which was, uh, 
uh, um, on the basis of uh, uh, five layer semantic, uh, five semantic layers. Um, uh, so the first data is that we um, uh, is an answer of to, to the question. So which are the mechanisms that brought to a certain homogenization of knowledge? So a possible mechanism is given by the fact, imagine there is one book. And everyone looks at this book and everyone starts imitating this book, like producing the same book with the same content, especially. So this is a way to explain how knowledge could become homogeneous in the sense that all the books become more and more similar to each other just because they are copying each other or they are copying one specific uh, example. So we found a similar phenomenon, obviously more complex, and we uh, realized that there are two families uh, that are uh, of books, of treatises, um, and they are connected to three, uh, family three and family four, that they became very, very dominant all over Europe in the sense that many other, uh, uh, many other books that were produced somewhere else started introducing uh, text parts that were introduced first in these families. And um, both of the families were initiated by the same printer who was very close to Melanchthon and uh, Luther in Wittenberg just a few years after the uh, Protestant Reformation, which obviously created the conditions for uh, being an interesting uh, uh, place to observe, especially Melanchthon uh, and what Melanchthon was doing uh, by also by means of the printers of the time. So the final result is that, uh, that we had here is that the, uh, the Wittenberger uh, treatises um, uh, introduced a, a series of new original parts. So it was very innovative, especially in 1531. They then were taken over by the other treatises uh, also initiated in Wittenberg uh, in 1538, seven years later. Um, then the first who adopted or imitated the treatises in Wittenberg were printers, uh, huge printer shops in Venice and Paris. And these were then the biggest production centers with obviously also better uh, international contacts and what they did is just not only adopting the model of Wittenberg, but also working on it slowly, uh, inserting, for instance, some commentaries, more, more commentaries. Wittenberg was a bit poor in terms of commentaries. And then out of Paris and Venice, then uh, this model spreads uh, basically all over Europe. So this is in a two step, in two steps, uh, Wittenberg acquired uh, 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 the Wittenberg treatises, not Wittenberg as a place and not the people, but the, the, the treatises, the content of the treatises of Wittenberg became the, the, the most dominant content uh, or in those book in this period. So say, this said, um, I would like to move and go a little bit deeper into a second study that we have done, um, to, um, which is not going to the next slide, and then one second now. And so for, for, the, for the next study, we um, had realized in the previous one that we did not consider enough uh, the role of those books that I mentioned at the beginning that we call adaptions that do not really contain the text of Sakodosko. And so we thought of another semantic layer in order to see what is the relations among all the layers by adding this one. So by having uh, the adaption books also more present or in a more clear way present in our, in our, in our network. And therefore, we added the layer that is called here uh, semantic 19. And um, <clears throat> this, uh, this work was published last year in Scientific Reports uh, Nature. As you see here, when we make uh, just uh, um, uh, we look at the communities by checking just only the out degree, we see that the communities that we had before, Wittenberg 1531, Wittenberg 1538, I mean, Wittenberg is all the beginning. Yeah? Then after that, we see all the other cities and so on. They're still there, so it did not affect the introduction of a new of a new layer. Did not really affect the behavior of those families, um, but we have a, a new uh, family, which is the community five. It's called here, and this community five is um, uh, it basically has an out degree that increases and then decreases. So it's a different behavior from uh, um, comparison to the to the other uh, to the other families. We also made other studies, uh, for instance, uh, um, uh, Loven community detections that allowed us to, um, to identify specific text parts that worked as a glue around which communities were created, but I had to cut this part uh, from the talk, otherwise it was too, uh, would have been too long. So let's keep going with community, community five and our adaptions, and we also have a look at all the other communities, uh, and we go back to our layers. So we made the layers not for nothing, we made, we made the, those layers 
in order to understand them better, those communities. So you make the layers, then you, 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 you make your uh, calculations, community detection, Leven or out degree communities, or in degree communities, and then you look at the presence of the layers, uh, or, or at the composition of the layers, or the community, sorry. And for instance, community four, which is the one that mostly defined the dominance of Wittler, uh, shows to you, here are different nominations, but shows to you that uh, what is very important in community four is the presence of innovation, original text parts, or what I said before, but also the presence of uh, layers 14 and layer 16, the presence of the commentary work while translations, commenting on commenting, adaptions are not playing any role. So in the 30s and 40s in the 16th century to gain hegemony, the key to success, so to speak, was in innovating, but also keeping commenting, uh, keeping commenting on, uh, uh, on the text and eventually, which means commenting always means also having reference text, commenting on Sacro Bosco, so maintaining the tradition in a way. It's a mix of, it's a mix of the two, but no further elements are, are in there. If we now move to community five, the one that has a different behavior, for instance, looking at the out degree, we see that having the original text parts is still in there, quite irrelevant. Then we have a very low values for other uh, layers, but then we have 100%, 100% for the uh, new layer that we introduced, uh, the layer 19. So it means community five is actually that community that mostly built by, uh, uh, by, adapt, by the adaptions. Now, what can, we, what can we do with all this? So we already had, had identified a process of emergence uh, of, uh, of a dominant community. Uh, and uh, we know that uh, also because of these adaptions that the content, uh, they say also the scientific content was by no means a static content. When we say geocentric cosmology, it doesn't mean that everyone uh, read Aristoteles or Ptolemy or Sacrobosco and no one had a new idea about that. They were still discussing things like how many spheres do we really have? Uh, nine, 10, 20, you find all possibilities. So very fundamental aspects of the geocentric cosmology were still in discussion in the 16th and even at the end of, of the 16th century uh, and at the beginning of the 17th century. So we have a continuous transformation. And um, so we wanted to see what kind of elements can we find or, or whether we can see whether there are elements of stability so that in a way also justify our purpose and the element of instability. So how can something change within, uh, within the corpus, do we, apart from the emergence of one family uh, in the 30s? And then uh, to do so, uh, so this is the type of stability and the instability, to do so we uh, looked at the, um, we measured basically the average age of the incoming links of all uh, uh, our editions and uh, on the left side, and the incoming, um, uh, sorry, and the average age of all outgoing uh, links uh, on, on the right side from each book to all other books to which they are, uh, to which they are connected. Here I'm showing to you the uh, plots where um, uh, everything is already normalized because the rate of production of the books uh, changes over time. So we made an aggregate uh, graph for all this, uh, which is our graph of reference, and it is uh, nicely here in the middle. Uh, and uh, so you, how can you read it? For instance, here, considering uh, the incoming, uh, uh, incoming links to the books, we see here the community five, and we see that it's very, very low, uh, um, the average age, which means that they are not connected to books before them. They are, New, they, they 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 appear there, and they are way less connected than many other books that are much closer to uh, much closer to, to to the graph of reference. If you look at the uh, at the same community five on the right side, so the outgoing links, uh, you see that there are some of them that are uh, above the, the reference graph, and this means that these books are connected are connected to many times after the publication. So to speak, and the higher and and the more times and the and the, the denser the, the the linking is to to their future, so to speak, and uh, and the more far away they they go. So in this way, we were able through this method, we were able to identify two sorts of uh, two sorts of books. Uh, one of them is what we call the enduring innovations, 
And this enduring regeneration, as a matter of, uh, of fact, is a subgroup of our community five, of our adaptions, exactly for the reason that I was saying to you now, because there are innovation at a certain point. They don't have, they don't come from, they don't appear to come from the past, so to speak. There is something new. But at the same time, they succeeded. Uh, they succeeded entering uh, into the system eventually because some of their text parts were, involved, were, were integrated in other editions. And uh, in a way, so they created, they became influential for a long time. So it's something that created, in a sense, the instability. So it, it is changing the system, but it is changing the system not just because there is you know, a singularity somewhere, but because so they slowly enter into the system by, by applying a, an, an innovation before in the time at a certain point. And we were also able to, um, to identify a, a little group of books that we called great transmitters. The great transmitters are those books that are uh, overlap with our reference graph on both, uh, on both plots, incoming and outcoming. So basically, from a formal point of view, uh, those books that are on the, on the graph um, on both plots are related to, the uh, to, uh, to many times in the, in the previous times, so in, in the past of each edition, uh, and to many time moments in the future of the edition. So this is what we, uh, we I called it a stability because this is this creates um, th this creates a form of continuity, and uh, uh, in along along the entire uh, the entire corpus. But I think in this case, then when we find this is the kind of work we do, and then when we identify these treatises, and uh, uh, for instance, these twenty five treatises that uh, have this specific this specific uh, behavior. Then, then it's the moment to go back to uh, close reading and have a look at those books. And uh, so I, I bring to you two examples. So the Enduring Innovations, uh, this is one example of 1540. Uh, it's published first in Italian and then later on translated into Latin and then uh, uh, also into French. So one thing that is uh, peculiar of the Enduring Innovations is the fact that in their edition history, because many of these books you know, were also textbooks, and so they are reprinted, they are re-edited many times, sometimes with differences, sometimes without any difference. So many of these books in their edition history have experienced one translation, either from local tongue to Latin, as in this case, or vice versa. So which already means that if there is a local tongue translation, means that this is already a book that goes behind, behind the, the class of the university. It's for a different audience, and usually also contains some more some aspects of practical knowledge like description or use and construction of uh, mathematical instruments or nautical something about nautical astronomy. Uh, so this is the first aspect. Another uh, very interesting aspect is the fact that they somehow become very influential during their. Uh, uh, during their history, they, during their they reappearing, so to speak, um, which is related to a, quite a relevant question in history, especially, I, I think, in any kind of history, but in history of science for sure, um, as whether we should look only at the Editio Princeps, at the first edition of each, uh, of each book, or whether we should consider also re-editions, even if the books are exactly the same. So it's the moment when the new idea appears, or is more or is relevant also to know when the new idea is re-suggested, re-proposed because the first book maybe didn't work or it worked too well, or we don't know. So here historians are uh, uh, a little bit divided and uh, our studies are concerning the, uh, our impression concerning the enduring innovations is that it is extremely relevant to look at the entire edition history. And uh, one, uh, one later, a, a re-edition, even identical of the Editio Princeps can become by work by far more relevant and more influential uh, than the first edition. It reminds a little bit the, uh, the subject of the Sleeping Beauty, if you, if you will. And of course, what is relevant here is that these books are adaptions. So, so this is uh, one point. If we now go to the great transmitters, this is for me even more, uh, more interesting uh, because uh, the great transmitters are only 25 and they are only published in, in a very small time window, 13 years. Um, and uh, we didn't know that, but then when we checked them, it turned out that they all published in Wittenberg. Uh, so again, Wittenberg. So in other words, what we are assisting here is the phase of consolidation of, uh, of the dominance of Wittenberg. 
So first they acquired a certain dominance. They, pro they produced many, they produced many uh, new text parts uh, or they printed new text parts. Um, and then uh, they, they, they kept republishing these new text parts. So there were no more so new. So they kept innovating, but their rate of innovations decreased a lot. But the tendentially these books started getting kind of thicker. So because they started in, inserting text parts that belonged somehow to the tradition and to the past, uh, uh, to what they at the beginning actually excluded. So if you want, we can say Wittenberg is becoming more conservative from a scientific point of view, but also keeping the innovation and keeping innovative. So this allowed Wittenberg not only to emerge, but also to consolidate this, this role and to consolidate it so that it was really uh, uh, then connected to uh, toward you know the 17th century basically. So it maintained a very relevant role. Although yeah. then over time there were also other communities that didn't enter now all the explanation of all communities, but we have other book communities that emerge or they become uh, also relevant or more relevant in a later period. And uh, if you look at the places of production, we go to. Uh, for instance, Antwerp or uh, other places. Okay, so now we come to the very last studies that we are doing right now. This is nothing, it's something that we haven't published. But the, once identified the, uh, the community, semantic communities, so, so what is dominant, what are the people uh, imitating, uh, why other books are taking over certain text, as text parts. So the natural question uh, that emerged was for us, to see whether these semantic communities can be correlated to social communities, so people, communities of people, like producers, authors. And so for this, we, uh, we created a little monster, which is, um, here again, I, uh, there, is, uh, there is a little function in my keynote that switched from, okay. So we created this monster, which is, uh, uh, again, a multiplex layer of 12, uh, multiplex network of 12 layers. So here on the right side, you still have the same six layers that we know from the previous publication. Uh, and then we have six more layers uh, uh, that we call layers for the social context divided into awareness layers and economy layers. Economy layers because they point to aspects that might be meaningful uh, when we analyze econ uh, economic conditions of production and or distribution uh, of the books, although they are uh, apart from one, uh, two of them have a quite uh, weak uh, historical meaning. It's just, uh, you know, we are looking for data and how, and how to uh, uh, create uh, uh, meaningful graphs because basically every graph represents uh, an hypothesis for the research question that I have in mind. Um, but collecting systematic data from, uh, uh, let's say, social point of view, uh, for this period, especially when we speak about the printers and, and the publishers uh, of this period and, and 180 years, uh, hundreds of people, most of them yeah, barely, un, uh, barely known, um, then it becomes really a challenging point, uh, a challenging issue. So it is impossible to collect systematic data where we say this person knew this person or has worked with this person or they were, I don't know, in the same classes. Or this is impossible of being systematic uh, about this. So that's why we created the concept of awareness. So we created, I mean, we came to the concept of awareness in, in as a consequence of a series of studies that we have done. So, and the series of studies are two international working groups, one dedicated the, the top to the authors, of the commentaries, um, it's um, yeah, an edited volume. Uh, it's a group of people who met uh, and uh, discussed for a few years about that, and this was published last year. And one that is going to be published this year uh, uh, refers to the printers and the publishers of the uh, of these uh, of this book. So this is really about the business models of printers and publishers involved in the academic book market of the early modern period. It's something that really book historians did not do uh, enough for us historians of science. And that's why here it's me and Andrea Ottore, who is uh, uh, part of, member of the group of Angela Novo in Milan, and they make uh, economy of uh, book history in the early modern period. So this is a joint, uh, joint work. And so coming back uh, to the concept of awareness, which we developed especially in the second uh, working group, the concept of awareness says that uh, one person is aware of the product of another person. So that's the only statement that we can do uh, with a certain systematicity. 
No, because everything else that is more precise, the person knew that person, or they went to, to dinner together, or whatever, any kind of statement, statement more precise would, would create a collection of data which is not systematic. So to keep the systematicity, we had to make a step back and limit ourselves with the idea to, uh, to, to the idea of recognizing uh, when, uh, for instance, a printer used a book of another printer in order to lay out or to produce its own book or her own book. Uh, so this is the, the maximum we can do, but in this way, we, uh, we were able to create three, uh, three graphs, which are in a sense also uh, quite meaningful. However, our idea of the correlation analysis did not really work perfectly. In spite of the fact that we created these layers, awareness and economy in a very, in a completely different way, and then from the semantic layers, it's really completely different approaches to, 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 uh, to the works. It turned out, if you see here, that uh, the uh, awareness uh, layers, the number of fixed links of the uh, awareness layers, is actually, if you look, you compare it with, uh, with the layer of semantic 13, it overlapped completely. This is a sort of, you know, we were extremely surprised. And because they really are completely different edges made on, on the basis of completely different uh, arguments. And we really don't have any difference. So which means that we cannot make any correlation analysis. The only difference is here, for instance, of, I don't know, eight, eight edges, so which is nothing. So you can't make anything. So this is the one problem, which is here. So there is a, a total overlap and we can't, make, we can't make any inference. Another problem, we had to give up a layer layer 16 uh, because it, be it behaves like a random layer. So in for correlation studies is not uh, meaningful. Um, then, uh, as I said already before, the economic layer one and three are not really meaningful, not really much meaningful. And so we'll, even if the numbers are different, we can't say, we can say much, much about that. But then at least we have one result, which is a negative result, but it becomes a positive result from a historical point of view. And the fact that uh, the layer economy two uh, uh, connects uh, uh, editions uh, that are produced by printers and publishers that live in the same city and were al both alive at times of their respective publication. So this is the, this is the limit. Um, so this is in order to create a layer that tells us something about localities. And in, in book history, um, there is always the question, especially concerning the academic book market, but in general, uh, whether the printers and publishers were mostly counting on a local market and then by luck going to a global uh, market um, or whether they were already thinking, uh, thinking global, so to speak, from, from the very beginning. So for sure, the local market was important for every printer, at least uh, those printers that we are dealing with. But this, uh, um, uh, the circulation in general in the semantic layers and this study seems to suggest that uh, in spite of the fact that they were in the same city, uh, the, semant the semantic relations uh, were not affected at all uh, by this aspect because it's really just 6%. So there is a local market, but they are eventually, they probably had the perception to be on a global market, on a trans-regional market, uh, European market with uh, international book fairs and, uh, and all the things that were happening in this period. So to conclude, I would like to, suggest to you to think with me of, uh, of a very important uh, historical question. So this is uh, something not, we are not going to publish in this way. Uh, it's something that we are really doing, uh, we have done it in, in the past and I collected some results, but also something that we have done like yesterday, for instance, with Mariam in, in a Zoom. So I would like to think with you on uh, of the question of uh, uh, historical temporality. So for instance, with this question is, is, uh, can be translated very easily in the specific question, how long should an edge persist in our network? When you have historical networks, usually many of us tend to say, okay, let's divide the network by time windows. I don't know, 20 years, 30 years, 50 years, depending on how many data you have. So when you divide the network in time windows, basically you are, you're answering uh, or you're trying to answer this question. So how long should an edge persist? And I would like to show to you uh, what we said, a few things that we have, we have done, a few approaches that we have developed to try to answer this question, because my hope is not just to create time windows um, in order to compare the networks and see whether I find something meaningful in them. 
My hope is to see whether there is an historical temporality, a, te a, a, a sort of you know, speed um, that we, we can uh, define and that it depends on the contextual, social, infrastructural, and semantic conditions of a specific epoch and maybe a specific subject, something that time which is inherent in this history that I am uh, reconstructing. Uh, and not just something that I use to analyze as an external uh, variable. Uh, so here, um, yeah, I should have started before, this is just a visualization of data. Uh, this is the first thing that we have done in this direction. It's already quite old, but it's still very, very interesting. So the first part of the video is not really on the topic. This just shows the text parts and their reoccurrences in, in the books um, over time, and some of them two times, and then we see now. But what is important here, and you will see in a second, is the fact that we inserted a, a tool, a ruler, into this visualization that shows or eliminates the parts if they are not republished within a certain uh, uh, time window. And now the mouse, I hope, will go up quickly. Yeah, and this is the ruler. So you see it now is positioned at, at, at zero time, at zero, uh, zero years. If we move on the right side, so this is the time interval within which uh, the parts is not published. And uh, so if it is not published within now 11, 12, 15 years, then you see that the, the corpus basically tends to disappear. So this is the parish, a publish or parish of the early modern period. Um, so it means that we have uh, the necessity of, of re-suggesting something, otherwise it is, it is uh, forgotten. And this re-suggesting, the timing of re-suggesting seems to be according to this very early study, something that moves around 20 years, maybe 25 years, probably the data were not yet uh, uh, totally clean, we should redo this, but this already gives the first indication. Then another, another aspect is that we did on, in the case of uh, the first publication, the one of 2019, as we looked at the number of links in each graph that are older than 50 years. And so if you see in certain of the layers, layer 13, 14, 17, um, and partially even in the aggregated, you can see it a little bit. You see that if you take away the layers, the, the edges that are older than 50 years, um, actually uh, uh, most of the graphs remain there. Uh, so you don't take away so much apart from these two layers, but this we assume that we have other problems with this one. So this gives uh, another idea. We had about the 50 years, maybe 55 or 60. I, uh, uh, it's a, a little bit unclear at the moment, so, but we are moving already between certain numbers that actually make sense from a historical point of view. So if we take 50 years, then instead of having, uh, uh, instead of having the time windows, our network will look, would look like this. And, and you see that the longer you, you position or the shorter you position, the more complex or less, less complex your network will be, richer, and maybe you can make, uh, you can make more uh, uh, inferences out of it. So I'm, I'm looking for the, for the time, for, for the speed, because the length, the length, uh, the temporal length of, of validity of an edge basically gives you the speed of uh, circulation and evolution uh, of a specific epoch. This is, uh, this is the point. And uh, so a very last study, this is really the last one, and we finished this, we didn't finish discussing, but uh, we, we discussed it yesterday night, really, I saw you. And um, so we made, uh, uh, we analyzed the aging process of for all the layers, and I'm showing to you only uh, the awareness layers, awareness one concerned with the authors, awareness two and three concerned with printers and publishers. Um, so we looked at it as a non-stationary process, and so the plot A and B is basically the same, it's just made in a way that you can see the difference better. Um, and you see that, uh, the aging process of, uh, of printers and publishers, especially in, in, in awareness too, um, uh, increases and then continue and starts a declining slope, let's say after 20 years, maybe 25 years. Uh, here, while the authors, uh, the awareness among the authors, uh, uh, it seems to suggest that it, uh, um, it decreases almost, almost immediately, it's very, it's very short. Uh, see, these, interpreting this, to interpret this, I would say um, the uh, printers and publishers were uh, more aware of themselves, so to say mutually, uh, than the author themselves. Um, they were copying more from themselves or imitating 
uh, what they were doing their products more than the authors. And this is quite in line with one other result that we achieved in this working group. Uh, and the fact that it turned out that the printers that published uh, were really were those who had the strongest power of decision concerning the content of the uh, textbooks of the university, way more than the authors themselves. So, and uh, so this, uh, these two aspects, this, this last uh, study seems to go, seems to confirm uh, these hypotheses, but we don't have yet an answer. I just wanted to show to you what we are thinking of, so thinking of temporality and which kind of approaches we are trying to develop uh, to go in this direction. And um, yeah, we don't have a solution, but let's say we have between 20 and 50, 60 years, maybe everyone could have, uh, would have said the same, uh, before this talk, but now we have more reasons to, to say this. And uh, yeah, to, uh, to conclude, um, really, so what's next? Uh, we want, of course, to use more data and make more graphs of semantic nature with the other uh, knowledge atoms, scientific illustrations, and computational tables. And we are thinking of uh, moving from the multiplex uh, structure to an interdependent network in order to, um, yeah, to use the data for other forms of modeling. And uh, to conclude, uh, already Martin said a few names. Uh, they are the names of these uh, last studies, but in general, the group is much bigger, especially when taking into account uh, uh, the machine learning aspects that we are developing and the librarians. Um, so this is, uh, this is the group at the moment, uh, how the mom uh, at the moment looks like. Thank you very much.